Hello and uh, welcome to another Microbiome Live event. My name is Clay and we are glad that you are here with us today. We are streaming once again from our headquarters here in Southern Oregon on this 18th day of October. These live educational and free events are hosted every Wednesday for your benefit. So whether you are already a Microbiome user or just looking to learn a little bit more about our software, either way we are glad that you are here today. In case this is the first time that you've joined us for one of these events, I'd like to just let you know how this session is going to work today. We are streaming right now on two platforms, uh, first here on our Zoom platform, as well as our YouTube live stream. So you can ask a question on either platform at any time. Uh, simply click that green button in the Zoom uh, webinar in the navigation panel, and that will open up your Q&A your panel. And that's your line of communication to our teams uh, helping out behind the scenes. Uh, and then again on the YouTube live stream, you can also chat there as well, and we will make sure that we get your questions answered. And we are recording this event, so it will be posted on our website and our help center within the next couple of days. And if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, we'll make sure you do that so you can receive uh, notifications on future live events. All right, so for this week, we have planned an overview of Toolbox for you. Uh, a demonstration from Ralph Butler, a longtime user of Microbiome, uh, service provider and now current account uh, exec based out of Virginia. Ralph is going to help us with a tour of the process going from the design phase or the submittal stage through to the manufacturing phase, producing the data needed to actually build the project. So he's going to show you that today. So without further delay, let's invite Ralph up to the stage so we can get started. Ralph, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Clay. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, definitely. So why don't you go ahead and share okay. your screen and we can get started. We'll okay. get to learn maybe perhaps a little bit about your background. I think that would be good uh, for some of those who haven't don't know you. Uh, like you said, there are quite a few in here that we, we do recognize, but some perhaps uh, it would be good to know your background a little bit. Sure. Yeah, so I, I, do, I do recognize a lot of names in this list, but there are quite a few I don't. My name is Ralph Butler. Um, I began using uh, microvellum products in, uh, right at the end of 1999 when I was working with the millwork specialist in Richmond, Virginia, commonly known as TMS Corporation. I worked with the program at two different companies, actually. One was uh, TMS, the other Merchants Fixture. And I still work with Merchants Fixture uh, as an account manager today. Um, so back in the day, um, Overdrive 2000 had just come out and I was working with that and um, I was actually down the hall doing mill work and the cabinet guys up the, up the hall would get overrun with work occasionally and, and they would ask me to, to help out. And so I went through a training with Kirsten Webb. She was around a long, long time ago. Um, and began to use it. And at first, you know, I was like, well, I don't know about this. I've been drawing for quite a while. So uh, as soon as I began to use the program, I started to notice that my drafting sped up. It was a lot of things that I had to do manually. I didn't have to do. And one of the neat things about it was I didn't have to cut list the stuff that was actually uh, drawn in microvellum. Uh, anything I had drawn in AutoCAD before I had to, everybody knows you do the hand cut billing thing. And, um, but with anything I did in, in uh, microvellum at the time, I didn't have to cut list those particular items because they were cut listed for me. I worked at Merchants Fixture for a while. They did food service stuff and uh, retail and things like that. And those were more complicated products than the ones that I was accustomed to using in, in uh, TMS, at TMS and uh, quickly found out just how complex a product I could create. Back in the day when I was doing that, we didn't have the tools we have today that you're going to see here in Toolbox today. Um, but I still found it pretty easy to develop products at the time. I caught on to it really well. Uh, began to help other people in areas that got that knew that I knew how to use the program, and soon Microvellum approached me about uh, visiting some of their customers on site to help them out with training and things like that. So in 2005, uh, I began to be a full-time uh, contractor for Microvellum, and I've been doing that with them full-time ever since training hundreds of companies. I've had thousands of students. Uh, one time we had the training center in Virginia. A lot of people came to and uh, 
had a few people working for me. We were, we stayed busy. We were, had a lot of people. There was a big time of growth during that period of time. And uh, back in 2013, I became an account manager, began to manage accounts on the East Coast, uh, east of the Mississippi. Some changes have occurred over the years since then, and now I'm an account executive, and I deal primarily with new sales. And I think most of the people that I recognize in this meeting, in the list of people, are uh, from the some of the folks that I've trained over the years. Um. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, so Clay, I guess we'll just get started with showing the front to back toolbox. Um, just begin with starting a project. And when I begin this project, what's going to happen is I'm going to actually make a copy of the template and create a new job. Um, or it's going to create a new job by copying the template settings and those kinds of things in today's world. Today, we have a single database. Back in the day when I started, uh, everything was open file structure, folders and things in your, in your, on your hard drive. Today, everything's within one database. So it, that facilitates a lot of the other solutions that we have, like our scheduling and purchasing and shipping. Uh, also with Fluid Design, the front end tool that we have that uh, allows you to do design work. Um, estimating and all of those things are using one database uh, to process work and, and to move it along through the whole process. So there's no redundant data entry. Everything is accessible by everyone within the company uh, for whatever task it is that they're trying, trying to do. When I start this up, you can see that there's some organizational tools here. Uh, there's folders uh, that I can place products in or projects in. I don't have to use this folder structure, but I can. I could add my own. This is all user definable. You can rename these. You can uh, add new categories, whatever you want to do. So if a product, if a project, I keep saying product, but if a project came in under uh, in, in estimating and I wanted to put it in quotes, I could begin it here. And then as it went through that process, uh, people could move it from one place to another. I'm not going to do a quote today. I'm just going to do toolbox. So I'll just go into um, something that's uh, in progress and I'll create a new project and we'll call this, um, uh, I don't know, the webinar 1018. So it's copying uh, specification group settings from the template. It's creating a brand new project and uh, placing it within the database. When I do create a drawing or a room, it's going to actually create a DWG and put it in a folder on my system. But the project itself is going into the database. This setup wizard that we have here, this project setup interface, allows me to edit attributes that might I might have on my title block. These are all uh, looking at the uh, at defs that are at attribute definitions that are in the uh, layout tab on in paper space on my title block. So you can use the ones that are here, modify, make your own. There are other selections here between user divider properties, correspondence. The project wizard is something that a lot of people enjoy using. This is different than the old 6-7 wizard. Um, this is actually a projection of the globals and, and the materials, some of the globals and materials onto this interface. And also the door wizard is here as well to, uh, be able to make selections for this project that might be different from your template settings. When a, when a company purchases microvellum, we have a number of services that go with, um, we, we, I was trying to read something I saw. So I, we have a number of services that go with the, um, with the, with, the, with the sale of the software. And one of them is to help you set up your globals for how you build cabinets and your materials for what you use. Um, and then once you start a project, you can change those things from your template settings. I won't really make any changes here today. You can get right into your global settings and your materials, the door wizard, all of that is accessible here. You can also access it through other parts of the interface as well. So I'll just close this and I'll make a new room. So I'm going to select the project here again, I can make categories or I can just add rooms under here. So if I had a first and second floor or first and second phase building one building two, I could create those categories and then add rooms under there. 
And I'll just call this break room and hit OK. And from here, you can choose your drawing template. I'm going to use the default that's here. We also work with annotative dimensioning and text. In this particular one, I'm not. Uh, I haven't set it up in this template, but if you like using the annotated dimension styles and text styles, you can do that. You can set that template up uh, this way for, for you there. And this particular one that I'm going to use now, um, we help you as one of those services to set up your layer properties, your dim styles and text styles and all those things. Uh, so that the drawing will look like you want it to look when you're making a job or making a drawing. So I'm, I'm in break room in my project and I can make additional rooms. Um, let's just say, for example, if in here I, I were going to have another room and I would call this reception. I can choose a different drawing template for this if I want. And I'm going to use the extruded product builder Imperial. This particular template has some things that are set up in it to, uh, to help you get started. You don't have to keep these. You could create your own typical sections, but these are great resources that are here already. When you purchase the program, this is you get these. Uh, there's a slim chance that the walls that you do or that, let's say, for example, you went out with a laser templater and you shot a radius feature wall that a reception just set in front of, or you took it off the reflective ceiling plan. It's probably not going to match one of these, but this is something that, that we give you to help you understand and learn how to use the software. Uh, and the sections that you see here, these are actually two viewports in model space. You can see these are the sections that I'm viewing here. And there's quite a number of them that are in here. Uh, there's all types of different things like seating, uh, walls, uh, die walls, feature walls, paneling, all kinds of things. So um, you can choose from these and, and use them um, to work with or bring in your own. We, well, I've got an example of something uh, later that I might use. I'm not certain if I will or not. But anyway, I'm going to go back and open up the other room, go back to the break room, and you can see it changes it here. And I'm going to draw. So I'm going to begin to work in here. Uh, Clay mentioned earlier that a lot of people know this stuff. This is you know, something that you're familiar with. Some don't. So I'm just going to show you some of the features that are here as we go through. Um, I can draw walls, molding, lighting, that kind of thing. We won't go real overboard with this today. Down here, if I'm going to do rendering, I'm probably going to want, want to make floors and ceilings and add lighting and that kind of stuff, but we won't do that today. I can draw, I can pick points using relative entry commands to draw my wall, or I could select the polyline. Uh, like we talked about earlier, being able to use reflective ceiling plan entities and things like that. So I'll just draw something here. To represent a little cove in a hallway where you might have a break room set of cabinets set up in a back office area. And Clay, I don't, I don't look over to this other thing too much. If there's a question I need to stop and answer, just let me know. Yep, you got it. I've been uh, monitoring these as well as some of the others. There's one here from Ken Hart that we'll get to, and if there's uh, one that we need to interrupt you with, we'll go ahead and do that. Sounds good. All right, so what I'm going to do is show you that I'm going to draw this in frameless uh, library, but you can see that the ship library comes with face frame and frameless. We used to have these combined together. And then we also had a frameless that was broken away, but in the face frame, you could turn off and on the face frames. We've simplified the cabinets. Lenny has done a lot uh, in streamlining the data as uh, we've come into these more mature libraries. But you get all of these when you get the ship library in the latest version of it. And if you're kernel support, when we come out with a new library, you get the ones for free that match what you currently are running. So if you were running this and we came out with a, uh, a, a newer library, you'd be able to download that uh, as a part of your support. So we have the other items in here like extruded products. Uh, and this is not to be confused with extruded product builder. These are the old ones that we had for extruded die walls and stuff like that. And there's fixture components and all the others that we've had. But I'm going to go in here and look at um, 
the uh, frameless cabinets. And you can see we have cabinet categories, subcategories there. We were never able to do this in the past, but now we can. We can have subcategories. And in each of these subcategories, we have quite a number of products. I, there are over 300 cabinets in the current library. So what I'll do is I'll go into the door drawer cabinets and I'll bring in the two door, one drawer base. I'm gonna right click and you can see we have a number of options here for how to draw. If we wanna fill this wall up, which is what I'm gonna do, uh, we can and it's gonna calculate the cabinets or I can place these cabinets on the wall and anchor them left, right or center. I can put cabinets next to one another if I'm doing them one at a time or I could uh, put them at a selected point if I'm developing a product or working on one or use that polyline again, like we talked about before. But in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and select this wall and tell it to kind of auto fill it. It knows the wall is 120 inches long. I'm gonna leave an inch on the left and the right for filler space. And it sees that I've got a quantity of three, so it's making them 39 and 5 16. So if I change that to four, they're now 29 and a half. So it's, it's calculating based on the known values that are here. You can also pick points. If I had a hole two for a refrigerator or a water cooler or something like that, I could use that as a reference and then go to my other side and it would, it would mark that off as well. So when the cabinets come in, if I were bringing them one at a time or four at a time, it doesn't matter. It's going to give me a prompts dialog box. And this prompts dialog box is, uh, prompting me to enter values that are local to the individual cabinets. Um, the default values here are coming from the global settings that were come from the template that I might have edited through the project wizard. But here I have another opportunity to make changes on an individual cabinet level. Since I'm bringing in four cabinets, I really can't do anything to it that I don't want done to all four. So I'm going to leave it alone just like it is. I'm just going to let it come in. I'm drawing today in 3D, which is the most demanding on my system. Uh, and I'm doing it for a reason. I want you to see some things about what's going on in microvolume. I'm going to be able to explain some stuff. But if I were normally doing just, excuse me, casework like this in shop drawings, I would probably draw this simple casework in 2D only. But if I were to go here to options and go to AutoCAD, you can see I have five choices in how I can draw. I can draw the 2D plan only, or 2D plan and elevation, which stands the elevation up into Z. You'd have to view it from a front view. And then I have three options for drawing in 3D, minimal, uh, then with a little more machining, and then with full machining. And so we also have visual styles, and there's a lot of other settings that are in here. And a lot of settings have changed over the years. So people that are using 6.7, uh, you, you've got a lot of control over your program uh, that you didn't have before in this version. Now that these cabinets are in, I'm going to go ahead and edit the one on the left and give it a left side wall filler of one inch. And I know, and I'm going to just say this because I know it's something that goes through the head of people when I do this. I've, like I said, I've had thousands of people in front of me when I was teaching. And I had a one inch space, so I had a one inch filler. That's really not a scribe. I can't scribe it if the wall's out of plumb. And people ask me all the time, well, how would you uh, account for that? Well, I could make this an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, and just let it go into the wall in my drawing and not worry about it. Or I can tell it that I want to draw this part one inch, but in the cut list, have it cut something oversized. Now, that's using a phantom part. That's, pro that's data work that you could have done to your library, that you could do to your library. But the Every scenario like that, that you could come to me with a question, I could just about give you a solution using this program because it is so user definable and custom, customizable. So I'm gonna give that a uh, left side wall filler and I'll go to the other one and give it a right side wall filler. You're gonna notice that there's countertops on each one of these cabinets. This is for drawing purposes only. Um, if I were, let's say if this were stone tops by others, this would be perfect. I can make my rendering. I'm not worried about uh, a single top that would go the full length. But in this particular case, you know, these are individual modular tops. I wouldn't do this typically if I were doing the casework and making a P-Lamp top. I would turn this off in the globals and I would bring in a countertop product that matches the way that I build cabinets. 
Now you can see, you know, there's a lot of work that's gone on here already by the program. I'm not drawing. I'm telling the program what to draw and where to draw it. So having said that, and I'm not going to say something silly like you don't need to have AutoCAD experience to be able to produce professional drawings quickly within a day or two. That's not going to happen. Okay, you need someone that understands drafting, that knows the requirements. What does an architect look for? What information does a shop need to see in a drawing in order to correctly make things and that kind of thing. But you can bring someone into your office and make them productive really quick because of a couple of things. First of all, they don't have to be you know, wizards at AutoCAD. They didn't, I didn't really draw this. The program drew it. So just learning a few tools, I can have these complex drawings brought in really quick. And second, I don't have to really understand cabinetry and joinery to the extent that you would have to if you were cut billing this or if you were drafting it and cut billing it because without this data behind it, because the, the joinery, where the dowels go if you're using dowel construction, how much gap between the shelves, where does the line boring go, all that kind of thing is in your library and it's proven data, you've proven it. Uh, and so you just have to teach someone what to choose and where to put it. And so it's a lot faster, a lot easier to get people up and productive using the software uh, or making shop drawings using this software. So I'm gonna go back to a plan view. I could stay there, but I'm just gonna go back here and I'll put some upper cabinets in. I'll use two door uppers and I'll do the same thing. I'll fill the walls. Hey, Ralph. Yeah, man. Hey, while you're right here, uh, there was a question. I think we've got it answered already, but I, I wonder if it would be interesting to highlight the answer to it live and maybe you can show or explain it a little bit more. The question came from Eugene and the question is, can I draw 3D minimal machining and have sections with 2D machining at the same time? Sure. Um, you're going to get, uh, your sections are going to reflect basically what, uh, you know what though, I, we, why don't we do this? Why don't I redraw it with minimal machining in a minute and we'll see what we get. Mm -hmm. Good idea. We'll see, we'll see what happens. So I'm going to go in here and make a change here and give this a left finish, a left wall filler run. And I'll go here and give this a right wall filler. I don't know about you guys, but the only thing I've actually drawn was I, I picked points for the walls where they go. And, you know, that's not that hard to teach someone to do. So I have this 3D elevation that, and I'm just going to go to a visual style of realistic. And you can see that there's going to be, there's a lot of data that's there. I don't have any lighting. There's no floors. You know, this is the default material that's here. You can, by the way, make your own material JPEGs and stuff like that for whatever it is that you offer. Uh, there's a conceptual view. There's a bunch of others as well. If you notice, I'm using type commands. There's a lot of you guys that use AutoCAD that like to use type commands. And I've got these all minimized up here so I can get a little more real estate back in my drawing. But uh, if you want to even add to add your hot keys or, or you know, edit the PGP file, you can do that. So, or you can use the tools that are up there. Um, and I've had a lot of people ask me, hey, can I use Toolbox and AutoCAD to draw something that's not Toolbox related? And I said, absolutely, it's AutoCAD. This is 100% AutoCAD. It's not a light version. This is an OEM version I have. If you own your own AutoCAD uh, and subscription for it, we can sell you the standard version, which works with your AutoCAD that you have uh, through subscription with Autodesk. So, um, but, and then the OEM, there's a couple of things that, that aren't allowed through that licensing, such as there are certain file types that you can't import. You can do a lot. You can do DXFs, uh, WMFs, uh, DWGs, all that kind of thing. But, um, and then the express tools are not there. But for the most part, that's, that's the express tools is what I hear a lot of people you know, might miss if they were to go to the OEM. But honestly, I, I don't, I've done a lot of drafting and I don't use them very much. The Rev Cloud is about the only thing I ever use. Exploding text doesn't work good because it's, it's not suitable. AutoCAD text is not suitable for routing. Um, but, you know, that's a call for the individual. 
So I've got this 3D drawing here. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go down here to 2D drawings. And you'll notice the 2D drawing or the drawing tools. These, this is a place that's, a, I'm going to go to the 2D drawings in a minute. I just want to talk about this real quick. There's appliances and furniture and all kinds of stuff like that that's in here as well. Um, and they behave like products, by the way. But this is the commonly used AutoCAD commands. People that are familiar with Toolbox and older versions are aware of that. The common text, if I just want to pop text out into the drawing, I can. Uh, the common blocks uh, for annotation. You can add your own blocks to these, to the program. The things that you use for elevation symbols, tags, labels, all that kind of thing, markers. They can all come in uh, in the software. So that's all there to help you as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in here and tell it I want to draw 2D walls. And I'm going to grab that wall that the cabinets are on. And it sees that I have cabinets on that wall. I'm going to let it select them all. And I'll hit OK. And I'll just come down here about 220 inches or so. Now, I've not done a thing to the drawing template here or to the products or anything. This is straight off the shelf. And so what you're looking at is totally as it ships. So with the verified dimensions and all that, that's all in here already. There's uh, uh, there are, you have the ability to bring in uh, blocks. If you go here and go to wall setup, you can put your own labels in for elevations and scale them like they should be, not like that one was. Uh, you can control the wall height and thickness and all that kind of thing. So, but this is a 2D elevation and it's looking at PL1 for the cover. And you can make this bring in, it, if, if, for example, if I did a final replace text PL1 for Wilson Art laminate, it could bring that Wilson Art laminate color that was assigned to material up in my elevation if I wanted to. Um, I can add to any annotations I want here in plan, elevation, or section. It can be lines, arcs, circles, rectangles, blocks, hatching, polylines. Um, anything like that. So whatever you use to annotate, uh, they can come in. Now think about this for a minute. This is a really big deal. This is one of the things that I've talked to a lot of people about. When you are making drawings for submittal and for shop, it takes you nearly as long to annotate your drawing as it does to draw it. So even if you brought in a block of a cabinet, you would stretch it into place and whatever, and then you've got to put in all this text and leaders and dimensions and all this other stuff. So you can spend about as much time annotating it as you did in actually drawing it. And with microvellum, you can actually have the annotations come in with the cabinets and be parametric to the cabinets. What that does is cut your drawing time literally in half. And some of the error, I know that everybody knows that sometimes people come in and pick the wrong thing. They might pick that line instead of this line and now the dimensions off the drawing gets out to the shop and somebody's coming in, stopping what they're doing, stopping you from what you're doing and asking you questions about a conflict they see. So with these being parametric, they're tied to the products and they grow with the products and they change. Uh, so that cuts down on the amount of error that you have as well. My boss at TMS asked me to actually develop our entire library to have that back in the day. So this has been around a long, long time, whether people realize it or not. The scale, the annotative scale that was set in this template right out of the bag was 3 8 inch, it was a foot. And I'm gonna make a section, so I'm gonna take this to one inch. Oh, I'm in an annotated dimension. Okay, never mind. I won't do that. Okay, I don't know. Let's see. I'm going to um, make a section of this cabinet and we'll do the thing with the other section with minimal machining in a minute. So I can do cross sections, plan sections, elevation sections. I can adjust the cutting plane, make it look to the left or make it face right. This was something we didn't do for a long, long time. We always looked left with the section. And so now we, you can choose which way you want it to go and you can adjust that cutting plane for that cross section for any of them actually. I'll come out here and set that section here. And then I'll repeat the command and go here. And I'll do the same cutting plane. We use that as the base point. So 
you can see that we've got all we've got pretty much all the dimensions you'd need. Now you can edit these, you can add to them, take some away, you can make whatever changes you want. But you can see that I've got a plan, elevation, and section. And I didn't really draw any lines other than to put tell this wall where to go using relative entry command. I, I would have put in a lot of section markers and elevation labels and symbols and things like that. But, you know, just for the sake of this demonstration, there's no need to do that. Um, what I'll do is real quick, I'll just come in here. And you can have this already set up. I would if it were me. Okay. Let me get centered up here. So here we are, that quick. And if I wanted, I could bring this down. I'll just do this real quick. Just I'll pretend this is on another page or whatever. Bring this in as well. And we'll print. And we'll do PDF and let's print preview. That, that's pretty nice drawing for not having done in much at all. I mean, that was pretty quick. So, and I did a lot of talking. So um, you could also have the dimensions populate with this plan view as well, but I just haven't set, I didn't turn that on. So I printed this and I've sent it out. And while it's out, we found out that we can get in and do some field dimensioning. So <clears throat> I'm going to go in and, all right, I just got a habit of doing that. I'm going to go in and modify that wall. I'm going to go in, there's a bunch of modify tools here. I'm going to, one of them I have is adjust wall links. I'm just going to grab that wall. And when I went out and field dimensioned, it went from 120 to what I thought it was to 116. Uh, so I'm going to enter that new length and I can anchor it on the left or the right, either one. I could take it all up in one cabinet or I could say I want it in all the cabinets. That's what I'll do. I'll just tell it, each one to take up an inch because it's four inches different. And I'm going to move this so you can see what happens and I'm going to update the selected wall. The first thing that happens is a wall changes and then it goes through and starts changing the size of the individual cabinets from 29 and a half. They should go to 28 and a half and they're going to bump them over and do everything it needs to adjust that. Now, granted, you don't always have the luxury of being able to do things this way. This was an equal, equal, equal. And I'm saying I'm taking up everything in it. I could have took up everything in one cabinet. Many times you'll get back uh, a drawing that says, you know, they want a product eliminated and grow some other cabinets and whatnot. So we have the tools to delete products and to, you can reprompt them and grow them and we can bump cabinets over. So all those tools are there, but sometimes you, this is a viable solution. So this is a pretty handy tool. Hey, Ralph, mm -hmm. there's been a couple questions here um, <clears throat> that I think it might be good to uh, answer live or at least to, okay, now there's a lot more coming in. Um, let's see, one of these ones here is from Jennifer. She asks, can you populate the room or project name to the viewport automatically? I think she might be talking about the title block, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, yeah, well, it, if that is what she's talking about, mm -hmm. you can. Yeah, you could put it in in the project setup screen. Uh, when we started the project. Uh, that's the project. All right. Yeah, we go, if I go to the wizard, no. The project setup screen, where did y'all move that thing, Clay? Right. I think you got to go to there to the, uh, to the project itself there. Okay, 
Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my bad. Yeah. So things like job description, job number, phone, general contacts. Now, if it's something like a contact or the estimator, architect, contractor, or draftsman, you'll need to put those in the database and you'd set them up under company setup. You have access to vendors and employees and all kinds of things like that. So you could put them in and the list would populate and then, and then that would, that's what you would have to choose from. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, you can create your own attributes as well. So. Awesome. Thanks. Hopefully that answers your question, Jennifer. There's another one here too. Um, before we get too much further away from what you have right now, Tyler is asking, how do you bring in different door styles uh, to draw? Uh, sure. such as raised panel, shaker, et cetera, those types of things, and have it show up in what we've got here. Sure. In fact, that was probably, that was one of the next things I was going to do. So let's say that, for example, uh, when I got my architectural submittal drawings back, they told me that they wanted uh, this upper cabinet to be a microwave. Okay. I'm going to go into modify products. And I'm going to replace, there's a bunch of modify product commands in here. These are things you can do to individual products. We have modify part commands as well. Uh, but modifying the product, I can, one of the choices I have is to replace a product. Notice I'm on the elevation. I'm not working necessarily with the 3D. I can, I can actually work with the section, but I'm going to go to the elevation and I'm going to tell it that I want to replace that upper cabinet with a two door, am I missing something? Appliance cabinets. <laughs> Thanks, Lenny. Two door appliance cabinet or is it appliance cabinet? It's a different category now. Oh man. Sorry. It's okay. Where is it? Appliance cabinets, that's angled, sorry. One door, two door, microwave. So it remember it sees that the settings that were there, for example, the right wall filler and the width of it and that kind of thing. I have some other choices that I can choose, like the opening height for the microwave, that kind of thing. You could also have the block of the microwave come in with it, but I don't think that's in there right now unless Lenny's added one. And We didn't extend the bottom. That's just the default setting that was changed. Oh, we did draw a little block in there. That's handy. Thanks, Lenny. I had a suspicion that might be true. All right, so let's just say this is 18, not 16. I shouldn't get that warning now. So it was telling me that I didn't extend my bottom out and I had a radius corner, and so. Um, made that change. Yeah, I think that's a good example, oh. Ralph, even though you ran into that, that, mm -hmm. that type of data for error mm -hmm. trapping for warnings for mm -hmm. users. You know, we have people that engineer and create the product libraries, and then we have people that use the libraries. And so that's a good way of making sure that they uh, are working within the parameters that uh, they should be. I agree. I think you're right. Notice this, though. This is another thing. You know, how many times have you drawn something and the phone rang and, you know, you were making a change, but you forgot to change the section? Well, I don't have to remember to change the section. It actually changed it for me. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that that's helpful. It keeps you out of trouble. And if you look at the 3D, it changed it there as well. Lenny, thanks for adding the appliance. I had a suspicion you did that. So it's got to keep you on your toes. Yeah, I know. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to this cabinet. Let's say they told me they want to change the door style. Now, this is pulling information from the project wizard from the door wizard and uh, I can make several, you know, a lot of choices. There's a lot of choices here. Walscraft, Elias, Caldor. If I went to Caldor and I went to a flat panel with cope and stick and I chose shaker, for example, and heck man, let's just put four lights in that door. How about that? So, yeah, I mean, and then and these are set by default to run with slab doors, you know, for the project, but I have one cabinet that I need to do different. I don't have to make a new spec group to make a change 
I can just change the product itself because a lot more prompts are out on the prompt, the choices are on the prompts page instead of just in the globals these days. I'm gonna change this to realistic again, let you see. You know, that's, this is showing glass. It's gonna cut list this glass, by the way. Uh, and if you did a rendering, it'd show up real nice for that as well. So there was another question about drawing with minimal machining. Let's see what happens. If I were to go in and redraw this product right here with minimal machining, I'm not going to put shelf holes in or anything. I'm just going to go minimal. And I'll go to a Southwest view so you can see it. See, it didn't show any of the machining and that kind of thing, except for the back dado. Um, if I had dado construction, it would probably show all the dados, but it's not showing a bunch of other stuff. And I'm going to go to uh, draw and draw sections, and I'll make a section of this cabinet. Let's do it at 12 inches, and I'll put it right here. And you don't see the machining because I didn't tell it to draw it. Um, if I were to go back and redraw this and add, for example, the shelf holes with minimal machining. So updating the elevation, the section and everything. So now it's giving me the shelf holes, but not the dowel holes. So it's going to draw what you tell it to draw for the 3D. That, I hope that answers the question. Yep, I think that was good. All right. So we've got this break room drawn. We did our field dimensions. Uh, we did our architectural changes. And we're ready to go to manufacturing, but we've got another room that I want to work in real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, um, but I'll go to project and I'll go to open up the other room, this reception desk in here, the reception area. And I'm just going to use what's, what's here already. And let's do this. Let's take this, this line right here. Let's use this one. And I'll use a tapered wall. Uh, I guess this will give me my stuff that I want to see pretty good. So I'm going to go down here to what we call solid modeling tab. And we've developed microvellum. I say we, I'm taking a lot of credit. I don't, shouldn't take. Microvellum has created, the developers at microvellum have really been working hard. They have uh, come up with some awesome tools. Man, would I have loved to have had this back in when I was working at Merchants. Solid modeling tools, um, the solid model analyzer that allows you, this one in particular, it allows you to draw 3D. If you're used to drawing th in 3D uh, and then you want to be able to convert those, those 3D entities, those solids, they have to be solids, uh, into a product and they have to be drawn, you know, correctly. In other words, if I were going to draw a skin, it would have, this, if I had a wall that was 12 feet long, I wouldn't want to draw one entity for the front scan of a wall. I would want to break it up in the size of the materials that I have and with the thickness that I have. And that way, when it analyzes it, it can find the material to, to use to, to create that part. But drawn correctly, you can take 3D solids, and they can be imported from uh, another software into Microvella and analyze those and create a product. So I don't have to go into a spreadsheet to create it or anything. This tool that I'm going to talk about right now is going to be the Extruded Product Builder, which is pretty amazing. I'm going to right click right here and add a product, and we're going to call this um, Reception Desk. And the type of product it's going to be is an uh, Extruded Product Starter. These come from the unique product builder. Uh, these are for the unique product builder, which works off of just single stick drawings, line drawings to create 3D products. Uh, you guys have probably seen videos of it, um, but I'm going to talk about this one here in particular. So I'm going to go to the extruded product uh, builder, hit OK, and pick that wall. Well, 
Okay, so I'm gonna let it update. And then I'm gonna go, you can see uh, that there are a number of things that populate in here under this tree view. Um, I'm still discovering a lot of this because it's brand new, they just redid it, but I'm gonna be able to go in here and add my, my extruded parts and pieces uh, to this. Now this that I'm making a window over right now is or crossing or this is a window rather. Uh, this is the equivalent of a 2D section. These are just section drawings uh, that you could bring in an architectural drawing. Uh, so that has not been assigned. What are we looking at here? Oh, hey, Ralph, this is a, uh, that, is a, a that is a DAO. That's something that can be <laughs> added later for sure. Yep. So we can just skip this entity. Okay. Let's yep. do that. And there'll be three times that will come up. Yep. Yep. And so the DAOs are assigned in a, a little bit different place. And this is an example of how entities are things that can come in from these section drawings that we can just skip if it's not something that we are concerned about. Awesome. Uh-oh, what happened? Look at this. I've got a wall already down here, man. So it took this thing that was just a 2D section. And because it was assigned, th these elements were assigned to the correct smart layers. Um, it actually interpreted these parts and pieces. They have materials assigned to them, joinery assigned to them and all that kind of thing. And it can create this product for me. And there are a lot of things that you can use. This isn't a class. This is more or less just showing you what we've got here that would give us the ability to to use this tool to create fixtures. And there's a lot to this, but what I want to do right now is just go ahead and accept it the way it is. And I'm going to right click and save this. And I'm going to save it. There's a lot of choices here for if I want to just uh, save it to the project or draw it. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to put it right there. And so from a 2D section and a polyline, it's created a, a 3D model that I can then convert into a microvellum product. And it just doesn't get any better than that in my thoughts. So what I'm gonna do next is with this stuff, I'm going to create a work order. So I'm going to um, actually what I'll do is I'll do this. I'll combine it when I get it up. And I'll go to the, uh, you can see that in, with this interface here, like in version six, seven, we always, there was one time a way and it was very hard to do. We could combine multiple projects into a single process. Uh, but here it's real easy. You can pick products across multiple projects. So if you want to get better yield, if you want to use, you know, combine two small jobs, you can easily do it. Or I can come in here and just pick things out of this other room. Uh, in this particular project, and I'm going to process it. There are some other tools that we've developed. If you look at the uh, tier, the tier options that we have at our, on our website, you can see that we have five tiers now. There's basic and there's plus. Uh, we have professional, premium, and enterprise. So with basic, you get drafting and some cut listing with plus, we can add to that non CNC saw optimization. And I'm just being very general when I'm on my descriptions here In professional, you're going to get single part G code with beam saw optimization. That's actually CNC beam saw. So the machine cell type of manufacturing system is accommodated in the professional tier and the premium. That's our lowest uh, nested base manufacturing tier. Um, we have things like block nesting, um, and stay down uh, nesting, um, run phase six first, those kinds of things. And then when you get to the enterprise, you have true shape nesting and scrap management and CNC auto labeling and these modeling tools like you just saw right here, these are in the enterprise. They can be purchased a la carte into a lower, um, lower tier, but after you get up past one or two purchases, it's gonna automatically try to upgrade you. Um, we've got nine products, 172 total parts. So I know how long it takes to hand cut bill. I've done it. Okay. And so I don't know anybody that can hand cut bill this many parts that quick. 
Um, there's just a ton of stuff that's in here. And you can sort these things by material. Uh, there are a lot of options in here. Uh, you can actually uh, set up many different machine machining centers, processing stations. Uh, for example, if I had a couple of different routers, I'd have two of these uh, in here for, for my mess. A point-to-point -point saw, I can have all of these in here. And then I can set up rules for what parts go to each individual machine. Uh, or I can actually map the parts and add code to the, the parts in the library that would automatically populate where these go to. So uh, there's a lot of things that you can do there. What I'm going to do today is I'm just going to select all these components, and I'm going to probably be told it's not going to nest certain parts. But I'm going to select everything and tell it to go to the nest, and I'm going to apply that. And it says parts with material from solid stock or buyout are not being assigned to any optimization processing stations. And that's fine because I'm not going to optimize my styles and rails for those glazed doors to my nest. And I'll hit process. I will get it cut listed. Uh, this has given me the opportunity to flip a part in a nest if it has machining on the bottom side but not on the top side. You wouldn't want to do this if it was not finished both sides the same, but I'm just going to assume it is because I know that was probably the door boxes. We do a custom tool file for each machine. Unlike um, a lot of people of, of our competitors, we charge time and material for additional machines. So let's say you purchased the program today and you connected to one machine and we set it all up and everything. And let's say you were doing nesting and you had one router and then you bought another router or upgraded your router and you needed a new post. We're not going to hit you with a large fee like, you know, $10,000 or whatever. What we're going to do is charge you time and material. The default is seven hours. If we don't take all that time, that's, that'd be 700 bucks. If we don't take all that time, we'll refund you or apply that money that's left over um, to another service or product. So it's done. I'm going to go in here and look at the reports. There's a ton of reports that ship with this program. You, by the way, have a report editing tool that comes with the program that allows you to create your own reports, or you can modify the ones that are here. There's buyout reports, door and drawer front reports. There's just tons of reports. The drawer box list. Uh, if you were going to buy out your drawer boxes and they were dovetailed, it would give you a total list of all those. Uh, you can get individual reports for hardware and edge banding and all that kind of thing, or you can just come straight down here to the end and get the work order summary report. There's a lot of options here. For the most part, these things meet most people's needs, um, but you can create your own for sure all day long. And you can edit these to, you know, have your logo, have the information that you want, uh, that kind of thing. So you can see there were no finished ends on these cabinets. And it was giving me a list of cabinets and the reception desk. It uh, listed all the sheet stock, solid stock, edge banding, and hardware. So this is like a summary. It's a work order summary that I could print out. Um, what's really cool, if I go to Nest Optimization Report, you get to see a couple of the things that we have, the features that we have that, that work for us in here. Um, now, unlike the drawing part, the section, it didn't show all the line boring, but you're going to get all your machining here regardless of how you drew it, okay? Um, but this is true shape nesting. This is nested all these studs in. Unlike block nesting, I'm getting a lot better yield on my, on my optimization. And there's going to be, uh, there's also scrap in here. We're, I've got scrap management turned on. So if a part qualifies for a minimum area or length and width, then it can become scrap and it'll, I'll get a label to, and I can store this and optimize out of it later. I can commit it to scrap inventory and optimize from it later. These reports are eight and a half by 11, and you can scan these barcodes. It'll pull up that G code file to run into machine, uh, helping to automate that whole process. So you can print these out and uh, we can uh, scan those and pull the G code up. We can actually send the code directly to a destination folder, whether it be on the machine or on the network for the uh, operator to pull from. I would recommend a destination folder that's not the machine because they shut the machines down and often engineering works later and 
you want it to go somewhere, uh, not just be lost in space. Uh, there's an optimization summary. This tells you how many sheets of material you need. This can be used to pull. And you see it's even counted that glass in. It tells me I need one sheet of that. Um, product detail report's another good one. This is a good bench report. I've actually seen people glue these on the back of a cabinet when it was done. You get one of these for each cabinet. This gives you, let me see if I can scroll up, get out a little bit. This gives you things like the hardware, the product description, what job, what work order, uh, the sub-assemblies that belong to this cabinet, and the cut list for the cut part length and the edge banding for each individual part separated by material. There's a master cut report here. This is a go, and I'll get out of the reports real quick. But this master cut, this will give you, you could make this cabinet offline with this report. Um, this gives you all the material that's in here, every single part, starting with the large cutting, going down to the smaller cuts, separated by material. So I'll get out of those reports and I'll show you the labels, product labels. Um, these are two by four labels. Again, you can edit these if you like. This barcode scan is for, we use this in a shipping module. It'll populate a load ticket for you. Gives you the information you need about this product, to know where to store it, how to pull it, and maybe even what room it goes in. You can put a comment in here that would say, you know, uh, in the comments that you could tell it to stage in, in an area or whatever for the guy that's unloading the cabinet so you'd know where to put them. Um, there's also the part labels. Now, if you put the, we've got a ton of part labels that come automatic. We used to get one. Uh, when I started using the program, we got one label, and but now we've, we're getting uh, all of those that come, and you can choose the one you want. If I go to show patterns, this is what you would see if you put the production, if you installed the Microvalm software interface on a computer out at the router or the saw, either one, and uh, you would get this sort of an interface where you could pull up the labels from Nest or labels from Cutlist, and you can see I've got my sheets here. And then there's parts within that. And I can pick the one I want. This works with touch screen as well. I'll leave my mouse over here and pick one of these. It works with touch screen. And I can uh, print the whole sheet or I can, you know, print these one at a time. A lot of people these days, one of the biggest things you can do to get improve your throughput on a nested based machine is to get an offload table. And so let's just say it pushes it all, all the parts off to the offload table. You've got another one running right now and you can print these out and put them on and you can see what that optimization looks like right here. So it's easy to find the, you know, the parts and the label and put them on. So that's there as well. Uh, there are other options. Let's say, for example, if I wanted to go to the drawings for, uh, for my nest, I can open up this composite drawing. Now this is something that's, uh, pretty pretty good. It does this is not something that you can do with just any other software. So, in fact, I don't know if anyone else does this. I'm gonna go to base bottom 1.01. That's the one that was on the far left hand side, and I'm just gonna. Boy, these are different too. I'm gonna go to nest editing tools, and I'll leave that floating. Let's do that. And I'll go to the routing tools and I'll grab me. That's fine. I'll use that. I'm in foreign territory right now. All right, let's see square cutout. And I'll draw a polyline on that nested part. I want to say I had to cut an access hole in the bottom of this cabinet right there. It only went a quarter inch deep. Let's change that. Pick that again. So 0.765. Now it's going to cut that part out. And it's going to left tool come. Thank you. I'm glad I saw that. So I'm done. And what I want to do now is 
I'm going to, I can make new code, but I can update the existing code as well. So I'm going to grab that nest and tell it, hey, I want to rewrite that code. I want to overwrite what I just did. I'm in post engineering. I'm in pre-production area where I'm maybe doing plan check. I'm looking at this and I see that in this nest, somebody missed making that cutout. So I don't have to go back and mess with engineering if I don't want to. I can just come in here and do this and then I'll go back and look and just reprint that nest optimization report so the guy can see that it's supposed to cut a hole out right there. This, oops, there, there it is. And it's in the code, that's how it got the drawing. So we can modify a nest after we've created the work order using those tools. That's about all I have, Clay, unless there's something else that you want me to do or if there's a question someone has. No, I, well, there, there was a bunch of questions that came in here. I'm trying to sort through some of the ones that uh, are relevant perhaps for you to answer. There's some still outstanding. There were some questions about uh, um, when we were back in the solid model analyzer, understanding the differences between solid model analyzer and the solid modeling tools. And so I thought maybe maybe I can just talk about that for just maybe a minute. Sure. And so one of the things that we've done, Ralph mentioned we have these tiers, and so we have five different tiers, and each tier has different default things available, and when we come out with new features, we decide, okay, this is, which tier is this going to live in? And then if you have our enterprise tier, well, then pretty much most of our uh, things that we came, come out with, new modules, new features, things like that, uh, features of the software are, are included in there. And so what we did when we came out with Solid Model Analyzer is we tucked that into our enterprise tier. And that's the tool that allows you to take a solid, whether it's imported from AutoCAD or Inventor, or maybe you draw the solid yourself there in AutoCAD. You can just simply analyze that and it uh, turns that, those parts into a microbiome product. So, that has, so you'd have to rely on your own abilities to, mod to model up those parts or importing them in. And so as Ralph is showing, we also had these have a, another tool, which is our solid modeling tools, or formerly known as the EPB or Extruded Product Builder tools. They've kind of been condensed, and I think we, we saw that in a, in a previous live event. Um, and so those, that right there, that those tools are available in our enterprise tier. And those are the ones that allow you to, or that help you uh, build those solid models quicker. We're, we have intelligence programmed into uh, sections, or not sections, but layers. Um, and so you can import sections from architectural drawings like Ralph was showing. Uh, and so that, those tools are available in our enterprise tier and can be added on, of course, to any, any other tier as well. Um, so there is definitely a difference. One is just analyzing something that's already done. The other includes that ability and even more than that, you know, allowing you to quickly create uh, looking to rules and, and uh, on, on how to lay out the parts and things like that. What do we got going on here, Ralph? You queuing up something? Oh, well, I mean, if we have time, I don't know. I just figured I'd do it. So yeah. So that was. I just wanted to make sure we got that cleared up. Um, let's see here. There's a couple more here. I think one that we had left open for you, Ralph. Looks like uh, Shane has mentioned this one to answer live. So I'll go ahead and read it for you. So another one from Tyler. He's been asking some pretty good questions today. Uh, so he has one more question. He would like to know how to apply moldings crown and base and light channels. Sure. Let me say this real quick. Yeah, um, we, 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 uh, we budgeted an hour for this event and we, it looks like we still have pretty much everybody who came who uh, started with us on the top of the hour at 11 with us. So um, appreciate you guys hanging on. We're going a bit over, but uh, it's a lot of good information. And thanks, Ralph. You bet. Hey, so, you know, if you remember when, uh, when we were in a draw command under draw room components, I select, I, I went, kind of went over this real fast. Uh, you can choose moldings here if you like, and you can add your own moldings. These are just 2D closed polylines that are stored in the system and they're on disk. They're not in the database. So they're really, uh, they're really easy to, to get to um, under the graphics. And uh, you've got all the graphics that are in here and so the moldings is here. And so you just have DWGs that were stored here. Real easy to, you don't, you want to be careful not, you know, and kind of open up the drawings that are there to know uh, how to draw the drawings so that they work, behave correctly. But we've got base crown picture case, chair rail, there's all kinds of 
moldings that are in here. But if I just grab this one, for example, and said pick points to draw molding, and I can just pick points. This is one way, okay? There's actually a, another, but what I'm gonna do is just pick those points and I can say above the floor, uh, let's go 96 inches. And I can make this add linear footage to the project and it'll give me total linear footage for each type of molding, or I can do each segment. Now, if you do each segment or linear footage, either one, you're gonna to have to add a percentage for outside miters, but, um, you know, if I did this, then when I make another work order, then it would give me my linear footage, but I'll just draw it like that. And so it gives me this, the moldings here that I can use for running or whatever. You can also, uh, and I'll just bring a cabinet in out here on the, on the side real fast. I'll bring in a two door upper and place it at a selected point. So if I just put it here, I didn't mention this either. You can say, I want this cabinet to be uh, certain 90 inches above floor or 96 or whatever, and make others lower. You can change the height. You can bump cabinets out to where, you know, kitchens have more interesting layouts than commercial cabinetry. So you can accommodate that. Um, but as I do this, when I go to the advanced options, you can see there's an option here for crown molding. And this is true on base cabinets as well. When I pick that, it populates another prompt that comes here, waiting for me to select this. There's a condition for this to show up. And you can do the same kind of logic on any option you put in the program, in the products. It's really easy to do. But I can also give it a pediment as well. Now, when I bring that in, you're going to see that it's going to have just a shelf hanging out there with a molding in front of it. And this is put together the way, you know, that we put together the data. So it's got the top is overhanging, the top shelf's overhanging the molding. Uh, if you wanted blocking in behind it, you can make it draw the blocking and whatnot. But I can also tell it, let's say, for example, if it has a left and a right finished in, and let's pretend this cabinet was taller than the ones on either side, then it would return the molding back on both ends of it. And then you could have the other cabinets would be shorter and they would butt into, die into the side of the cabinet here you're going to get these cut listed as well. So I hope that, that helps to answer that question about, about the moldings. Awesome. Perfect. All right. And so there was a, I'm kind of going back here to when you were processing, Ralph, you were talking about um, our abilities to connect to different machines. And, you know, we have the processing center where if you have multiple sheet machines or one machine, you can kind of uh, address where those parts go automatically. We saw how you can assign them to the nest or to the saw or to even multiple different types of machines. And so there were some questions that came in regarding how we connect to those machines and how much we charge and how that whole process works. And so I know you mentioned it a little bit, but just wanted to make sure that people were fully aware of how we handle that because it's different than what people might expect or what they might see from other companies in our uh, markets. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, we, all right, let's, let's say, for example, now this has nothing to do with the functionality of the program as to whether you're doing single part G-code or nesting. There's a difference in the purchase price of the program between single part G-code and nesting, just like there is between no G-code output and single part. So as you move up that ladder, you're using more complex algorithms, and so you're paying more for the program. And that's how we can keep the price down for people that don't have any machining or people that are just doing point to point with beam saw. But uh, and when you go to nested base manufacturing, then you're going to be using another algorithm altogether. Um, so there's a price difference in those. But for the actual machine connection itself, whether it's a point to point machine or a nested base router, it's the same. We don't charge different for one or the other. And we charge time and material. It's seven hundred dollars is the default, and it's going to we're going to create a tool file, and that tool file is a an Excel file, an XLSX. Uh, in some cases, we also have .NET tool files that uh, that have just recently come out, and the pricing is a little different for that. But we it is time and material, and um, and it's typically seven hours for. Uh, a conventional tool file setup. And if I were to go into the interface and look, I can look at it in spreadsheet mode or through the interface. And it, there are settings that are involved, like whether we optimize the drills or they do, um, what the, you know, what the, what's the origin of the machine? What's the top of, what is zero and Z? Is it top of spore board or top of material? Um, 
and all those kinds of things. So the settings, the field sizes, some custom settings. Um, and then we load up the, a list of the drills uh, for vertical and horizontal and the routers and saws. Um, this is something that once we've created it, you can manage it. I mean, if you um, wanted to add new routers that you were going to use here, you can do that. Um, we also have multi-pass tools. So if you're going to do step routing or multi-pass routing, we can, you can do that, whether it's using a single tool or multiple tools within an operation. Um, but yeah, that's what it is. It's a, it's a file that we create to connect. We create what's typically known as a post for your machine. And that is an Excel file, um, that has all that information for that machine on what tools are there and what parameters are in that machine. What, what do they need to call the, the parts and pieces? And there's, some, there's a lot of other stuff that's there, but we charge, uh, for that by the hour. And it's not like we, we do uh, some of our competitors um, I've heard actually charge up to about 10 grand to add another machine to, uh, to the out, to the system. And we don't do that. We charge you uh, for the program and for its functionality. And then when you want to post to a new machine, it's a time and material charge. Great, Ralph. I think that was a perfect explanation. Thank you. All right. So yeah, I was going through some of the other questions that we had and I think we got most of them answered. It was a quite a busy day here for the, the questions. So that was great to see. And yeah, thanks again, Ralph, for your, uh, your um, demonstration there of a, from design from the submittal all the way through to production. I think that was great for that. Hey, you're welcome. I'm glad to do it. All right. So yeah, thanks again, everyone for uh, joining us today on another Microbelm live event. I'm going to go ahead and launch a, a survey here so you can let us know how we did. So as I uh, finish up here with this other information I have to share with you, if you can take that, that would be appreciated. So next week we are going to be having another live event, of course, and we are going to be having, it's actually a very timely event. Uh, we released our version 15.5 a couple weeks ago. And so it's been out there. We've got a lot of people upgrading to it. And so what we thought would be appropriate right now is to go through an upgrading best practices uh, event. And so we're inviting back some of our techs to help you understand the best ways to upgrade, having a look at setting up a, set, a sandbox environment, upgrading your OEM. And that, that was a couple questions there related to our OEM 2018. Yes, that is out. And next week we will be talking to you about how you get that, how you make the transition from a previous version to the new and how that all works. So that's going to be good for you to get some information about that. Um, also, we're going to be looking at uh, getting familiar with some of the changes that were made to the UI. Ralph mentioned uh, quite a bit through this uh, demonstration today, some of the interfaces that he was used to working a certain way have been modified. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of those changes. And we're also going to uh, run through some of the best re uh, practices related to testing. So yeah, you can get your sandbox environment, you can see the, the new build, but you know, when, when should you go through uh, and push what you've upgraded to through to production? You know, when, when do you make that call? And so we're gonna have some of our techs talking about that to help you understand the, uh, the best practices for how to get that going. So again, to register for this event as usual, you can go to our event calendar on our website and there you can uh, register for that event. So that'll about do it for today. Uh, thanks again, Ralph, for helping out. I think this was a great event and one that you probably benefit from watching again later. As was mentioned uh, by a couple of people, it's always nice to see uh, the different setups, the different workflows of how people use the software. It's not a one size fits all, one way to do it. It's, it's very flexible. Um, and so that was great, was great to see uh, the workflow there from Ralph. So again, I hope you have a great rest of your week and we will see you on our next Microbound Live event.